Okay, I think we uh, we just got the message here from from Pamic to to begin the the webinar. It's a few minutes after ten. Um, this is Scott Esworthy from Brown Schultz Shannon and Fritz, principal in the insurance practice, and my partner in crime. Ken, introduce yourself, I guess. Yeah, good morning, everyone. This is Ken Huggin Doubler. I'm a partner and industry practice leader with Baker Tilly. Very excited to be here. Scott and I uh, and our and our committee have assembled some great speakers. So we're looking forward to being with you over the next two days. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, this is the first time PAMIC has ventured into the webinar format for one of their longtime seminars. So, so we're excited, I guess, to be the guinea pig <laughs> of the of this uh, this item. Hey, some additional announcements before I, uh, we turn it over to uh, the Deputy Commissioner here, Acting Deputy Commissioner. Uh, first is the uh, thank you to all the sponsors that are out there uh, as part of this seminar for PAMIC. Uh, you'll see them come up on the screen throughout the day. Um, Ken and I just want to extend our thanks to the, our fellow members of the Financial Management Committee. Uh, everyone, in, everyone came together um, really well on, on meetings and calls and Zoom meetings to, to schedule this event today. Um, next, there will be polls popping up, okay? So I'm sure many of you have been on these types of webinars before. There will be polls popping up uh, twice a session uh, for CE purposes. Please answer the questions on the screen. So, um, so you'll see how this goes in the first session. If you have questions, you know, let us know. And if you do have questions to point out, PAMIC uh, was recommending, uh, at the bottom of your, your Zoom screen there, you should see a Q&A. If you have questions, submit via that Q&A function. If you just toggle at the bottom, you'll see that. And um, Ken and I will, and PAMIC members as well, will try to respond to those. Um, let's see, every attendee will be receiving their CPE certificate via email. Uh, with the conclude at the conclusion of the conference, not sure if that'll be today or actually it won't be today because we have a two-day conference. Probably Friday of this week, I would assume. And then, if anyone that needs general CE credits, uh, they should have provided their license number upon registration. Please email Andrea uh, at astrobel at pamic.org if you need assistance with credits. Um, if they didn't provide it, they will need they will need to do so to receive those credits. So, so those are my prepared remarks uh, handed to me by the the nice folks at PAMIC. Um, at this point, I want to introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, we have uh, Melissa Greiner. She is currently the acting she's in the acting role of the Deputy Insurance Commissioner uh, for the Office of Corporate and Financial Regulation. Uh, the deputy oversees bureaus of financial exams and company licensing and financial analysis with a total complement of 72 full-time staff. Um, she most recently served as the Bureau Director of Financial Examinations for Pennsylvania. Um, Melissa also has been active on several NEIC committees uh, through the years representing the Casualty and Actuarial and Statistical Task Force and chairing the Actuarial Opinion Working Group. Um, additionally, in her past, uh, 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 Ms. Greiner has been with the insurance department for more than 18 years. And likewise, prior to the department, she worked in industry, in the insurance industry, PNC, for 10 years. And then lastly, I want to note that she was a uh, proud graduate of Elizabethtown College. And I wanted to point that out because so was I. So I'm going to put this up here. Got my Fear the Bird little Blue Jay coffee cup <laughs> this morning. So, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner, I guess you can take it away. Uh, thank you, Scott, for that introduction. And um, thanks to everybody for joining today. Um, I can't see all of you, but I, I'm thinking I may have met many of you over the years in my tenure working at the insurance department. We're um, reporting under Steve Johnson and then Joe DeMemo. Uh, as deputies for this office. I certainly have big shoes to fill, um, but I'm very excited to, to accept this challenge at this point. Um, Joe only left three and a half weeks ago, and um, so there, there's a lot to learn in this new role. So thank you for your patience as, as we move through the presentation. So here's what I would like to talk about today. Um, 
uh, for the 2020 financial management seminar. Talk a little bit about our organizational structure, um, everything COVID, everything I'm going to talk about today has some kind of COVID impact to it. Share with you some industry statistics, um, talk about the impacts and the reviews of some of the information our area looks at related to recently passed legislation, and then maybe finish up with a couple of talking points about a new state-based insurance exchange that has formed um, with assistance from insurance department staff. Joe said I could talk about anything, so you get what you get, you don't get upset, right? That's what I used to tell my kids when they were small. Um, I will probably put a little bit of a financial examination spin on some of these topics as we move through them. So um, I'm gonna start with a little bit of an overview of the department and the structure. Uh, I think last year, Joe mentioned to you that we had two new senior level staff um, start last August of 2019. Uh, they are still in place. I'm um, not sure how much detail you can see on this slide, but what's important to point out is that the light purple boxes um, report functionally to the insurance commissioner, Jessica Altman, and the four dark purple boxes, um, I'm, I'm filling one of those roles right now in an acting role, functionally report to Mike Humphreys, our chief of staff, uh, and he's been in place for a little over a year now, um, coming from the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance. One new change that has been made to senior staff uh, since last year is we have a new policy director, Megan Barber. I believe she started around February of, of this year. So this is what an organizational chart looks like um, as of March 2020 for the Office of Corporate and Financial Regulation. Um, again, I said I was going to joke that, you know, COVID has, you know, we'll blame COVID for everything. And, and the fact is I couldn't even get an updated organizational chart um, for this because the one staff person in our area who updates these charts does not even yet have her own Commonwealth issued laptop with the proper uh, Microsoft Visio software in order to make these updates. So we use something that was prepared for another purpose, um, but I'll point out some of the staffing changes um, made since then. Um, as I said, Joe retired about three and a half weeks ago. Um, another change from last year is that um, our executive secretary who served in, uh, in a role supporting Joe and. Maybe you would have talked to Stanley Freeman um, in scheduling some of the meetings come into the department. She took another position that allowed her to work from home. Um, ironically, she would be working from home now too, uh, doing the same job, uh, but we've attempted to fill that position and we're unsuccessful in finding the proper, you know, the right candidate for the fit. So that position is still vacant um, at this time. This is what the Bureau of Financial Examinations looked like in March. Um, you know, the staff that I managed uh, to go out and, and do the, the financial exams of our domestic insurance companies. Um, talk a little bit about some of the COVID impacts on this org chart. So I have a position down here that was marked as vacant in March. Um, ironically, we had, a, um, we had an examiner take another position in the Commonwealth in January of 2020. And we had someone who formerly worked in our bureau, worked in industry for a couple of years, was interested in, in returning to the department to work once again as a Commonwealth employee. And so we're in the process of reinstating um, an examiner with a CFE credential, the Certified Financial Examinations credential, to return. And she had a return date of March 23rd. Well, then when everything uh, related to COVID hit and we were all asked to work from home, her, her position was really put on hold. Um, fortunately, she was very patient and she was able to continue employment with her former employer for some time and we were able to bring her on board in June of this year. Um, back in April, Phil Judge, who was our Western Region Examinations Manager, many of you probably met Phil over the years, he also retired in April 
um, after serving the Commonwealth for about 20 years. Bill's position remained vacant for some months until a hiring freeze at the Commonwealth was lifted. And one of our strong examiner threes, Stephanie Omak, was reclassed into the vacant manager position and she started in her new role in just July. Um, on a positive note, something that COVID has allowed to happen is um, when I agreed to step, step into the acting deputy position, I asked and recommended that Matthew Milford, who is also an examination manager living in the Pittsburgh area, to step in as acting director of financial exams. Matt is a very strong leader, great organizational skills, he was actually awarded um, a special award from SOFI, the so um, Society of Financial Examiners, uh, for being the outstanding um, state chair this past year. Um, and so what we were able to do was promote somebody from the, from the non-central Pennsylvania area into the role of director for the first time. And after working in the director role for four months um, from a telework environment, um, we, we proved that we were able to, to continue this and Matt has stepped in and did a, done a good job so far transitioning into this his role um, from a telework environment. So again, I realize this is a small slide The names are not so important um, as are the roles. Uh, Structurally, there are about three director level positions that report to me as the deputy. So one is the director of exams. The other two are um, the director of company licensing and financial analysis, that is Kim Rankin. Karen Feather um, functionally serves as the director of the company licensing division. Um, the sizes of the two areas, though, are quite different. There are currently only six staff in the company licensing division, and there are about 24 staff currently in financial analysis. Um, although it appears, that, you know, we we have we have asked for, and we would really like to uh, get two additional financial analysis supervisors and four additional um, entry level analysts. Um, we have budgeted right now for three. Interviews have been conducted and we are ready to make offers to hire one supervisor and um, two analysts. Um, just realize also with this that there are a lot of new financial analysis staff working. Many of them have been hired within the last three years or so. And so it's a, it's a great period of transition right now for the entire analysis division because the analysis staff have all also moved to a risk-focused analysis approach, if you haven't heard, which aligns more closely with how financial examiners have assessed um, company risk um, in their day-to-day -day work. Um, these changes were um, enacted by the NAIC but it, it's a material change in mindset for analysis staff to learn the process. And you know, it's our hope that a lot of the newer staff don't have to relearn something, they're learning it for the first time. But it does require a significant number of staff to review all the filings that you submit into the department, um, including annual analyses, quarterly analyses, various form B and D filings, holding company analysis for groups, or of filings, um, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm going to transition a little bit into the COVID-19 uh, timeline um, that impacted all of us and specifically talk about how the Commonwealth and the governor prepared uh, for, for that and how we were able to transition our workflow and our successes with that. So I, I reviewed uh, my, my emails and kind of relived a little bit of history as I was preparing this slide presentation. And as far back as late February, um, all Commonwealth employees were asked to complete a basic survey to confirm uh, you know, whether they had Commonwealth issued laptops versus desktops. Uh, you know, very simple questions as we were beginning to think about um, and plan for a different type of work. 
Um, now also keep in mind as we move through these slides, you all know too well that the year-end financial statements are due to the department March 1st. Um, so it's a very busy time of year for the whole Office of Corporate and Financial Regulation as, as we were entering into these transition um, workflows. Um, on March 6th, we got the first email from Dr. Levine and Governor Wolf confirming the first two presumptive cases of COVID-19 in the Commonwealth. Um, and, and they were identified as adults living in each Delaware and Wayne counties. And we started to wash our hands more frequently right around this time. In early March, we also began receiving emails um, from the governor as well as the department senior staff with the questions and possibilities of staff working from home. We started getting reminders to take our laptops home on a nightly basis. And we continued to have internal discussions about staff working remotely. By March 11th, the NAIC canceled the in-person spring meeting scheduled for March 20th to the 23rd in Phoenix, Arizona. So we had to start canceling hotel reservations and airline reservations. Also on March 11th, uh, I believe this is a Wednesday, the Philadelphia State Office building, uh, we got an announcement was closed for cleaning and all employees were sent home. Uh, I do have some staff who live in the Philadelphia area who go into the Philadelphia State Office building for their daily work. And I had one examiner who was sent home early that day on a paid office closing. Same day, governor, um, the governor's office issues travel bans on all international and out-of-state travel. Um, March 11th, the NAIC then sends email blasts to all chief examiners and chief financial regulators encouraging staff examiners to work remotely when possible. Not a really a big change for financial examiners um, since many of them work off-site. Um, there has just been a general trend to do a little bit more work remotely. Uh, it saves examination costs, it saves travel costs. Um, but this work also extends to the vendors that um, support Pennsylvania examinations as well. So we reached out to our vendors at that time as well and sent the message that they should not be going on site into uh, Pennsylvania insurance company offices to conduct their daily work. The Office of Administration in the Commonwealth sends reminders to employees um, to make sure that they follow Commonwealth um, IT security policies. We were focusing on stressing to all of our employees um, the, the handling of confidential documents um, if you do have to work remotely. Um, we began to ask other questions internally. How would we respond to company meetings already on our calendars? Could all the employees have access to uh, and work through the Skype meeting function, which is largely what we use for scheduling Commonwealth meetings. Do we have enough Skype licenses for staff to schedule those meetings and host those meetings with their own PIN numbers? Um, our heads were really beginning to spin at this point in time. March 11th, the Office of Administration develops a temporary emergency teleworking arrangement, as well as an expansion of leave and the paid status for impacted employees. These teleworking agreements um, were first rolled out to those employees who lived or worked work um, in the counties with confirmed um, cases. As I said, Delaware County, I have one employee or two employees who live in the Delaware County um, area. And then it was rolled out to Montgomery County. I have another employee who lives in Montgomery County. He had to start working at home immediately. Um, and then we got word that some of the schools were closing in Montgomery County. So I had another mom, you know, whose child went to school in Montgomery County, and we gave her the permission uh, to begin working at home immediately um, as early as March 11th and March 12th. March 12th, we had additional internal planning meetings um, to, you know, again, survey um, employees to make sure that they could successfully work at home. Do they have the ability to work at home? Do they have a successful um, 
reliable internet connection so that they conduct their work. Uh, we did find out that there was one employee who does not have Wi-Fi in his home. There's a second employee who lives in such a rural area that the Wi-Fi signal is not really reliable from his home location. So we had to start thinking about alternatives for um, a couple of employees. Again, on March 12th, then the NAIC sent a survey to chief financial regulars, uh, regulators, I'm sorry, about emergency preparedness. On Friday, Mar March 13th, uh, was really our last day in the office, but we didn't know it would be our last real day in the office. And so we all left for the weekend expecting that we would return to work on Monday. Um, and we were advised late Sunday night uh, with the governor's announcement that mandatory telework was in place for all employees working in the Capitol complex area, um, including those who've never worked from home before. So they were told to stay at home if, if you don't have a laptop um, and you know wait for further guidance. So on Monday, a lot of the staff in the Office of Corporate and Financial Regulation did come into the office for a couple of reasons. There was a last minute deployment of laptops and other devices. We attempted to give them some very quick training um, but we still all believed it would be temporary um, for a week or two. So here were some of the real impacts to workflow within the Office of Corporate and Financial Regulation. So I'm going to say my financial examiners, because those were the, the folks that I supervised for, for four years. Um, they really are home headquartered. Not many of them had permission to work from home, so they still traveled into a state office space or a company location to do their daily work. But, the, you know, they were used to working in different locations, taking their laptop home every evening, um, being able to, you know, plug in and uh, VPN or, you know, dial into our, their virtual private network for the Commonwealth. Um, as needed to get network files, but really oh, most of the examination work is done in Teammate. Uh, it's cloud-based. It's been cloud-based for a number of years. They all have laptops. So the transition for financial examiners was really like not, not a big deal at all. We had a bigger impact on financial analysis staff and company licensing staff. They are all based in Harrisburg in Strawberry Square on the 13th floor. Uh, many of those staff did not even have access to the VPN software, let alone how, how to work it. Um, a lot of their work relies on paper-based filings. And um, so on, on Monday, March 16th, a lot of that staff loaded up on, on a couple of paper files on some key activities and projects they were working on before leaving the office that day. And in fact, they wanted people to come into the office and get out as soon as possible. I think I stayed till about two or three o'clock that afternoon. I was one of the last people in the office on that Monday. So here's just a review of some of the paper-based filings um, that are re you know, required by um, the analysis division, our holding company filings, biographical affidavits, which include social security numbers, CPA letters, including changes in CPA and CPA letters of qualification, uh, reinsurance transaction filings, the upcoming CGAD filings. Um, we had to adjust our workflow and our approach to addressing, uh, and had to think about how to handle those paper filings in this um, telework only environment. So, um, Decisions were made to accept electronic signatures for many of those filings, in, including examination reports and acknowledges of receipt of examination reports. Uh, the, the one thing that we struggled with was how do we get notarized uh, board affidavits signed um, in this unique kind of environment when notary offices were closed and many, some insurance company offices were closed um, for board, member, board members to come in and get those acknowledgements signed. Um, we still required those notarized affidavits, but we extended really almost on an unlimited time basis, the turnaround time to return those for our examination reports. Um, by the time late March came around, we, we realized it was more of a long-term stay at home, work at home situation. And so the talks were beginning at the NAIC level on how to survey 
and talk to our insurance companies um, about their preparedness. So the COVID-19 survey to which you, nearly all of you responded to, um, the survey was um, developed with the guidance and oversight of the NAIC. So the Pennsylvania survey followed the NAIC template and our surveys were emailed out to all domestic insurance companies um, by our analysis staff. Uh, all the states were encouraged to follow the lead state approach to requesting, receiving, and sharing information on, in groups involving a holding company structure uh, that spanned a number of um, domestic states. So there were three sections to the survey. It was actually a fairly brief survey, and it was our hope that insurance companies would be able to complete those um, in a fairly short turnaround time. So in total, we sent out about 125 emails in the early part of April with responses requested by April 15th. So, you know, uh, April 15th came and went. Um, and as far as the results go, the responses varied greatly um, as we would have expected. Uh, I think we all recognize that Pennsylvania has one of the most diverse insurance industries ranging from large, complex commercial groups to the smallest uh, local mutual insurers and, and everything in between. And so the responses to those surveys um, did vary as we expected them to. Um, most responses actually came back and, and indicated that management expected little to no impact on the insurance operations. Um, in, 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 reviewed the in reviewing the compiled results of the surveys, the, the next highest area of response were expected impacts on the uh, company's investments and the markets um, driving those investments and the possibility of lower returns. A handful of responders expected there could be some impacts to claims or reserving trends as a result of COVID-19, some impacts on underwriting and premium, and only a handful of offices actually closed. Uh, I think we recognize for, for this group, the, the, the mutual insurers, at least the smaller mutual insurers, many do not offer business interruption types of policies. And, and so I think that was the reason why um, the impacts were expected to be minimal overall in operations. Our analysis staff was responsible for making an assessment on the reasonability of those responses. Um, and after looking at those in hindsight, I, I guess I would wonder if insurance companies would answer the same today as they did in April 15th, you know, so. Here we are almost five months later and um, some business has returned to usual, but there, there's so many in the industry who are still um, working in the teleworking environment. I did also want to mention that there were two small mutual insurers who did not respond despite analysis, many attempts to follow up and get answers to their questions. Another thing I wanted to mention that on or around April 13th of this year, um, then Deputy Commissioner Joe DeMemo sent out a notice um, to all domestic insurers and licensees providing guidance and clarification on um, the timeline for submitting financial filings. Um, it was developed after careful consideration and guidance from NAIC as well as our own senior staff. Um, to, to generally, companies were still required to submit filings on time, um, including the first CGAD filings, and if they were not able to meet a statutory deadline, that they were to contact their assigned um, analysis staff person through email. So again, no broad extensions were granted at that time. So now I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk a bit about um, property casualty industry results for 2019 based on information we get from the NAIC. And, and Joe had talked a little bit about these statistics last year. So for 2019, um, the United States PNC insurance industry produced a net profit of uh, just over 62 billion 
uh, compared to 57.6 billion just a year ago. The increase um, was due to an improvement in underwriting income combined with stability in investment. Um, the profit combined with unrealized capital gains resulted in a 14% increase in policyholder surplus to $891 billion of surplus across the PNC industry at year end 19, representing a new all time high. I'll also point out that investment yields were fairly flat um, at about 3.2% in 2019 versus 3.24% in 2018. Net written premiums climbed 20 billion in 2019. Um, net written premium growth increased by a moderate 3.2% and earned premium about 4.4%. Um, the NAIC staff believes that the market is beginning to show some signs of firming up. And in fact, commercial lines experienced rate increases for nine consecutive quarters with the exception of the workers' compensation line. Just a couple of um, points about premium growth um, by type of industry. So the personal lines market, um, just over half of, of all the premium um, grew nearly 4%. The commercial lines market represents just over a third of direct written premium grew 5.5%. The combined light market um, represents 12% and grew 7.8% last year. Talk a little bit about underwriting performance. Um, so we talked about the $8.4 million underwriting gain um, that could also be attributed to lower catastrophe losses, the premium growth, and uh, a trend of prior year reserve releases. And just to talk a little bit about combined ratios, in 2019, the combined ratio um, was also very good, coming in just under 100% at 98.7, slightly improved over the 2018 result when it was 99.3, and in 2017 when it was uh, over 100% at 103.7. a couple more notes on underwriting performance in the industry um, personal lines which is you know again the lines of business kind of represented more by this group um, proved to be profitable in back-to-back -back years in 2018 and 19 for the first time since the 2013-14 time period and um, the improved performance was partially due from a lower cat year overall Commercial lines, um, generally more unprofitable in 2019. Their combined ratio actually increased um, over the 2018 results. Commercial lines have been unprofitable in the last three or four years, driven primarily by other liability occurrence, commercial mole peril, and commercial auto liability. And commercial auto, is it's something we follow very closely in the office of Corporate financial regulation has actually reported nine consecutive years with a combined ratio more than 100%. Shift gears and talk a little bit about cat losses. Last year, um, worldwide overall losses from cats amounted to 150 billion, um, spanning 820 different worldwide events versus 186 billion in 2018. So again, a lower cat year in 2019. I'll be interested to see what 2020 looks like, you know, just watching the news the last couple of mornings with all the wildfires in California and out west. Um, I think this year is going to be a bad year for cat losses. Um, again, 2019, um, there were a couple of cats related to floods, but they're often not insured uh, like other events are. Uh, the past two years, though, 18 and 19, were significantly less severe than year 2017, where overall losses from cats were as high as 340 billion. Uh, in summary, the largest cat events last year were from Midwest storms and flooding, hurricanes, and California wildfires. 
So I'm going to shift gears again and talk a little bit about um, legislative updates or the impacts of some legislative changes um, passed in Pennsylvania the last couple of years. Act 41 of 2018 is probably one that I'm most familiar with. Um, affectionately, we call this the exam transparency bill. And so for any of you that have come in for company meetings um, within the last couple of years, we give you a high level overview of why Act 41 was passed and why it's so important to um, both financial examinations and market conduct examinations. It was passed in the summer of 2018 and really addressed issues related to examination budgets, companies having input and um, comments about those budgets, revised some billing guidelines, and um, annually repro reproduce a financial report on the cost of our examinations. So just a reminder again of how those, the changes of Act 41 impacted insurers. You're getting more earlier and more comprehensive disclosure of exam costs. Um, companies have an opportunity to have a discussion with department staff about the details underlying that budget and overall get a better understanding of the examination process. Um, really, it's all about transparency. I don't know, I had that there twice, I guess for emphasis. Um, but really, how, how did the changes of Act 41 impact um, the department? So first of all, it forced all examiners, both market conduct and financial examiners, to prepare budgets in advance of starting material examination work. Budgets had to be prepared in advance of kicking off meetings. Um, where, you know, we would call them a kickoff meeting. I think the bill actually calls it a scheduling conference. Um, the Bureau of Financial Exams had been running kickoff meetings for years as part of our process. I think it forced the market conduct staff to also engage into an official kickoff meeting. Um, we put extra controls in place between um, assigned examiners, exam managers, and the Bureau Director, myself, in terms of reviewing those planned budgets. And there's better and more frequent monitoring and oversight put in place at various stages of the exam. So not only in the planning stage, but at various points throughout the exam, we would take a peek at the budget and making sure that things were running on pace and on schedule. And then we internally, we have a couple of procedures as we wrap up an examination to summarize the cost as well. Today, I really wanted to provide you more statistics and background on the real impacts of examiner time on financial exams. Um, know that for the companies that were examined on our 2017 examination cycle, we did lower the hours on more exams than we had shown increases in hours on the exams, which is our focus. Um, we do expect that the sec second risk focused examination should take less time and hours to complete and we are seeing the real impacts of that. Um, the work on the 2018 examination cycle um, budget reviews is essentially done. There's one small mutual exam that is still open at this time, but I did not have sufficient time to gather all those statistics. So here's a plug for next year's um, PAMIC financial management seminar. So make sure you sign up again next year and I'll have more statistics to share with you then on the actual results of the 18 and hopefully the 2019 cycle as well. So we do have to provide some fiscal reports um, and these can be found on the department website. And so I am showing you a brief summary of the 2019 and the 2020 costs. It is broken down by financial exams and market conduct, both um, staff costs and vendor costs, and you can peruse that at your leisure. The one thing that you don't really see in these statistics, and just as a reminder, is that um, none of my financial examiners have really traveled since March 16th. So um, we have about three and a half months where there was no mileage, no parking, no per diem, no hoteling, no turnpike tolls. And so that those are all real savings to our examined insurance companies at that time. 
Now I want to talk a little bit about um, CGAD, the Corporate Governance Annual Disclosure, which has been talked about for many, many years. I'm just trying to watch my time here. And so I'm not going to rehash everything that CGAD necessarily covered. But um, what, what financial regulators are really hoping to get out of CGAD reports is so that the analyst could identify significant corporate governance strengths and weaknesses, uh, as well as information that could pose threats to the risk of an insurance operation or an insurer's capital position and um, identify a need for possible follow-up with those insurers. It should also uh, enable examiners to have a better understanding of the insurer's corporate governance framework at the beginning of an examination to enable them to test and review how that framework has been implemented as well as evaluate its, its effectiveness. Key points um, with CGAD filings, um, it, it may provide information at the ultimate controlling person level, an intermediate holding company level, or an individual legal level, depending on how the group is organized. Um, when the Model Act was being developed by the NAIC, we made sure that there were strong confidentiality protections put in place to protect information um, for each insurer. Um, know that the department may engage a third party, party consultant to assist with the review of those filings, but those consultant fees are not charged back to the insurance companies as part of the analysis process. The analysis are the primary reviewers of CGAN filings, and there are no filing fees in, involved with that reporting. The act was signed into Pennsylvania law July of 2018, and the Model Act did become an accreditation requirement this past January. I think last year, Joe reported um, that only 23 states had passed the CGAD Model Act. Um, but as late as June of 2020, it was adopted in 49 jurisdictions and the model regulation was adopted in 44 jurisdictions. Uh, making it an accreditation requirement sure gets states to move more quickly on passing laws. So as we talked about before, there's no exemption provision and it does apply to all Pennsylvania domestic insurers. Um, and it applies to an insurer who's part of a group where Pennsylvania is the lead state. The first reports were due um, by June 1st. Um, Joe DeMemo sent out a reminder to all domestic filers last September. Um, although the Model Act does not contain explicit provisions for filing extensions, we did grant a few 15-day extensions upon those companies' requests this year for the first filing. So June 1st came and went. What have we seen? Um, most CGAD filings were received on time. As expected, larger companies provided more robust filings as opposed to the smaller entities. Um, I think the analysis staff generally found that the companies have benefited from the examination process as a number of the governance policies now aligned with some of the findings on our more recently completed financial examinations. But the key point here is that material analysis work has not really yet commenced on these reviews. Um, in talking with the analysis supervisors, they have shared that the newer analysts are enthusiastic about learning how our Pennsylvania insurers manage their corporate governance. These reviews will be an educational experience for all, as we do, as I mentioned at the beginning, we do have a lot of new staff employed at the department less than three years, and there really is a lot to learn. Um, I think the CGAD filings will be a good foundation type document to get them started. And at this point in time, CGAD is not yet heavily utilized in examinations. Um, as many exams on the 2019 cycle are still in the planning stages or the early stages of those exams. The final topic, which I wanted to address this morning, um, talks a little bit about the state-based insurance exchange. Um, initiative that was started by the department. Joe provided you probably a lot more color on this topic last year. Um, it's a topic I'm a little bit less knowledgeable about and comfortable with, but it's so very important to um, many people at the department. Um, and the program now has a, a nickname, Penny. It's really a play on words. 
um, pulling on Pennsylvania Insurance Exchange um, for its acronym. I'm not gonna read through this slide. It's basically a repeat of what Joe may have talked to you about last year. Um, so there was um, an Act 42 uh, that was developed, I believe in 2019 uh, to create and facilitate such a state-based exchange in Pennsylvania. Um, but part of the program was developing a reinsurance program, which would be utilized um, really as a cost savings measure to the individuals who signed up for the exchange um, to, to share in the cost of their health insurance. A um, couple more facts about how the state-based exchange idea was born and developed and as well as some numbers about um, the, the savings of the reinsurance program um, really could save on premiums roughly five to 10% to folks who sign up through the individual market. So there's just the acronym PENNY once again, with um, just kind of a little bit of advertising and marketing. I think the first folks can really sign up at the end of this year, the end of 2020, um, into that exchange program. So once Act 42 was passed, we had some folks involved at the insurance department as well as some folks in the governor's office who worked on developing um, the 1332 waiver application. So here's a timeline of some key dates related to the development of um, the waiver, um, how they define the reinsurance program, the timing of the submission, um, the federal government deeming the application complete, um, again, March 12th, a key date for a lot of us um, in the insurance industry as we transition with COVID issues. And then even the Health and Human Services and the Treasury Department approved the program as late as July. Uh, this is just another schematic to show the cash flow illustration about how the exchange and the reinsurance program uh, works. And by the way, some of these slides were borrowed from the commissioner who gave a very recent presentation to all department staff. Um, so this is a timeline of the rate reviews. Um, filings were due back in May. The, um, the health um, staff in product regulation are reviewing those rates and responding to questions uh, through July. Um, the final approved filings are going to be made public sometime in, a, in October, and then in November, um, the final rates will be published to potential members. So there's significant developments in this program that occurred um, since last year. Some other rate review um, considerations uh, to think about is like how medical trend is considered in the cost of healthcare. Um, risk pool changes are to be determined. Um, there could be some COVID impacts impacting rates, but you know it's really unsure to a lot of folks at this time what those are going to be. But these are some considerations that everybody is mindful of um, as how the impacts of COVID-19 are impacting the healthcare system. So it might be some time till those facts are really ironed out. The impact certainly will vary state to state and even within a state um, regionally. Um, costs of medical advances, including costs of vaccines, could go well into the following year. And, but the dollar amount of those claims may be so small that it falls under the reinsurance minimum. So we are really approaching the end of the presentation. I'm sorry to have blown through those last slides on the exchange, but uh, this is more for informational um, for the membership. Very good. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Insurance Commissioner. A very good presentation. Uh, there was just a couple questions from the audience, and I think what I'll do is just facilitate these, and, and I will ask, ask you the questions instead of going sure. To the questions. Gen generally, there's a couple questions about the corporate governance annual disclosure document. 
Um, in general, the types of questions centered around ultimately, like you said during your presentation, your group is really just starting to review these and so forth and, and get your hands around them. I guess at some point in the future, would there be some sort of report that maybe the department puts out that, I don't want to use the word findings, but basically um, better ways to improve the document, some sort of like best practices or something that maybe the department might consider putting out? That's a great question, and I actually anticipated that, Scott. Um, in just working with the companies over the years, like they're always interested in feedback, and, and I understand that. That's very important to the insurers. Is like, are we doing this right? Did, did we nail it? What did we right. miss? And so I think that kind of document, maybe in some kind of high-level summary fashion, would be helpful to everybody. Um, at this point in time, I'm not sure that each individual analyst will have the time and resources to right. give an evaluation of each specific because it really is your document it is the insurer's document um, just explaining their practices and their oversight um, but in terms of best practices common observations that i agree would be helpful for everybody and I would assume something like that would be probably a couple cycles down the road, honestly. I mean, after, after, you've, after you and your folks have seen a, enough of these to really put some sort of document like that out there. I would, I would, sure, yeah. sure. Um, wanna, Ken, I see you've popped up on the screen. Do you, do you have any questions for the Deputy Insurance Commissioner? I don't want to steal the show here. Oh, he's muted. <laughs> well, hey, I have, I have another uh, question there, uh, Melissa. Uh, for, because of, I know our firm and just like most businesses, because of the pandemic, this is very open-ended, so I'm not trying to catch you off guard or anything. Just big top, top level here picture uh, question. Um, is there anything the department, because of what you lived through with the, with the pandemic, is there anything that's coming out of that probably that you can see ultimately might change how you operate. Like for example, with our firm and like everybody, the concept of working a lot more remotely is just something we see a lot more in the future. Um, is there any operational things like that the insurance department might see coming out of what we all experienced with the pandemic? That's sure, another good question, Scott. So one of the things that we have been thinking about and have been discussing it internally is the continued practice of just paper filings. Um, again, the analysis and licensing division are a little bit more heavy with paper filings and, and asking for those wet signatures. So we're thinking about it from a legal perspective. Um, we're thinking about it from a processing perspective. We're thinking about it from a storage um, in uh, document retention, like we have retention guidelines developed in place. Um, so we're record retention guidelines. So we're thinking about all those things right now in terms of how do we change our workflow? And, and so one of those items does relate to paper filing. So right now, I, I think we've been asking our companies to email them in if possible, to follow up with the hard copy mail um, at some point in time. How that changes going forward, I'm not sure what that's going to look like, but those are some of the early discussions that we have. And, you know, I think everybody thinks about um, the use of office space and the rent that's being charged back to the various state agencies and, and what does that look like? And, and this is quite ironic for our area because with the expansion of the analysis area that I talked about in the beginning, we went through a complete office reconfiguration um, that started last summer at this time, tearing down walls, cubicles, rebuilding. Like we probably went through five or six different floor plans with the Commonwealth's vendor um, to come up with the right floor plan that allowed enough cubicle space as well as filing cabinet space. So even with analysis and licensing, there were 65 filing cabinets that we needed to like displace and move. And the office configuration phase three just finished up in late February. And 
the filing cabinets were just kind of put back in place, but not really in the order we expected them to be. And I had made sure I had space for my exam managers who come in once a month and would meet with me from, you know, my Scranton and Pittsburgh areas. And those managers never even got to see their new cubicles um, because they were part of the phase three development. So we went through this whole office reconfig and spent a lot of money and no one's sitting there. Right. So, you know, it's, we're, rethinking about how how's that going to look because we're still being encouraged to work from home and not come into the office so it's really a, a weird feeling i've gone back in the office two or three times um just for a couple of random things to pick up water my plants they're they're all wow. dead but um it's a very strange feeling because it you you look back and like time has frozen uh mail was open there's paper clips lying on the floor things were not filed as they should have been there's documents sitting on the printer from march it's just it's an odd place to be um so i don't know what that looks like going forward but we we do talk about it we talk about what positions are more conducive to working at home full time examiners for me are a no-brainer um, the other areas of, 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 of my unit, we may need some face-to-face -face interaction at some point. Yeah, that's very interesting. It sounds like the department's wrestling with the same business decisions uh, every business out there is wrestling with, which makes sense. Yep. So, well, very good. I think that sort of covers the questions, I think, from what I reviewed. Um, Ken, before I think there's only a couple minutes left, did, did you have any questions for the Deputy Commissioner here? So you know, you obviously have a unique background that has been different than your predecessors. You were you know, an actuary in, in, in the private sector. You've gone up through the uh, financial solvency division. And I guess what, what changes do you envision? I know you've only been here three weeks already. I'm not even that. But what changes do you envision, if any, in the risk focus exam process? So I really don't. I'm not going to be a big go-getter out there making all kinds of changes, you know, to our processes. Um, I've learned a lot from Steve Johnson in his years as deputy. You know, he always had a, a, a practice established to, to meet and talk with an insurance company's representatives the year of exam. So that gave us the opportunity to understand if there is new management in place, you know, what is the insurer's business plan, what, what are they forecasting, what are they looking out for in the next couple of years. I want to continue that practice of meeting with insurance companies, you know, so that might meet once every five years or so um, before they go into an examination. Um, I learned a lot of things from Joe as well. He certainly had different strengths, a different style of leadership. Um, but if anything, I, I want to continue being a business partner with all of our domestic companies and keeping the lines of communication open. Um, transparency really is key um, in all aspects and uh, I wanna keep an open dialogue and discussion. So if, if any of the insurers in the audience have questions, um, you can reach out to the PAMIC folks to confirm my email address. My phone number is still up in the air. I don't know what phone number I'm gonna have eventually, but um, <laughs> if it's the deputy's number or so office numbers are still tied and ringing to our computers somehow, but I don't know how people are calling me, but email is probably the best way to get in touch with me. And so if you do have questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Great. Well, thank you so much, Missy. Again, congratulations on your new role. We're all looking forward to working with you. We're now going to take a 15 minute bio break, uh, get uh, refill your coffee, uh, check emails and whatnot. We'll be back at 11.15. Tony Latini, of, uh, managing director of Benning and Scattergood and, and a longtime friend of PAMIC will be on to give a presentation on the M&A uh, markets. So uh, we'll see everyone back in 15 minutes. Again, thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you.
All right, well, I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I think we're uh, close to 11.15. And, and plus, uh, Tony, just to let you know, my colleague and partner, Hank, said, by the way, everyone could hear us chatting just then. So we have to, <laughs> we have to watch out going forward. <laughs> all, all good stuff, all good stuff. Hey, um, so, uh, so hopefully everyone can hear me in the, uh, in the webinar. Uh, Basically, Tony's joining us, Tony Lentini's joining us today from Boeing Scattergood, uh, managing partner. Uh, Tony has over 30 years of experience in finance and investment banking in the middle market and dealing with large corporate clients. Um, uh, in regards to, he has, he has dealt with a specific M&A transaction experience, including approximately $2 billion in transaction value, and he has assisted in raising in excess of a billion in debt and junior capital as well. So uh, we're excited to hear, hear you, uh, your presentation today, Tony. And one thing for the group, um, the uh, folks from PAMIC reminded, there are pop-ups, little polls, and they're very simple questions. I was watching it with uh, Melissa, with Deputy Insurance Commissioner's presentation. Simple questions that pop up, like who's, who's presenting the presentations, PAMIC, so forth like that. Um, you need to answer those uh, to the participants if they do want CE or CPE credits. Um, those need to be answered. And I, I got sort of the sense from the folks at PAMIC, not many people are answering those. So I think you guys uh, uh, want to want to sort of catch those when they pop up and answer them. So, so that's it. Um, Tony, I'm turning it over to you. Oh, well, thank you, Scott. That's uh, very nice of you. Um, and thank you all for taking the time to participate in this annual event. Uh, I think um, I'm really happy to be here, even if it's virtually. Uh, I think if you've heard me speak at a PAMIC event in the past, you know it's a very special group for me. It's the, the first of the industry associations that I ever joined, you know, so many years ago. And uh, I, you know, I definitely feel at home when uh, I'm with this group. Um, I will tell you, I am new to giving presentations over Zoom. You know, we're all getting so used to all these different video channels. Um, but a formal presentation, this is a, 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 actually a first for me. Uh, I'm going to try to provide the information that, that Scott and Ken and the committee designed. A uh, little more difficult when you're not in the room together and you get a little bit of feedback and body language and things like that. Um, so look, I'm going to try to leave time at the end so that if there's something I've went off the track on, something that just didn't come through, um, you certainly be, uh, you can be in a position of asking a question. And I think uh, Brittany has set that up well, and Scott and Ken can, can relay questions. Um, I actually had a couple of thoughts on, on this whole video presentation thing. Um, the first one came from, and, and I should tell you, I have the, the wonderful privilege of serving as the chair of the Board of Trustees at Newman University down in Southeast Pennsylvania. I learn a lot from, from that role. Um, one of which occurred the first day that the university went virtual, which is if you're one of those folks that likes to move around when you talk, and I do, I'm typically doing this and that, don't do that in a, in a Zoom presentation. It doesn't doesn't work, people wanna see you and, and, and you wind up moving off camera. Um, I also learned that there is sometimes a delay in a PowerPoint presentation in terms of the slides moving like a second or two. So if I wind up getting ahead of things, I think, uh, I think it eventually catches up. Um, and, and I also have to say to you, uh, this is the first time I've had a tie on in five and a half months. And uh, you know, I thought about it, but I said, Hey, look, you know, if we were together at Hershey Country Club, probably have a tie on. So uh, why not? Uh, why not do it here? You paid for the event. You deserve a tie. Right. So um, let's see if we can get uh, started here. I'm going to share the screen and the presentation and we'll kind of take it from there. OK, uh, so the, the, the topic here is an M&A update. Uh, and as I think about it, it's quite an interesting time to um, give this presentation. You know, we're about five or six months into this new environment. And um, I will tell you, for 
the better part of the last 30 years, if I've given a presentation on m and I have been highly confident in most of what I was going to say and the little bits that I wasn't very confident. I had a pretty good educated guess about. Uh, not so sure today. Uh, this is a very fluid environment. Um, we are fairly active right now and we're learning a lot on the fly. Um, so all I think I can do is, is, you know, I can share some data with you. I can share what we're experiencing in real time. Uh, I can share some guesses and what's going behind some of those guesses. Uh, I, I thought I'd also compare some of what we've seen in the recent past to what we're seeing now. Uh, but all of this is evolving. Uh, so um, I will take a step back maybe from my usual confidence in, in talking about this topic uh, and just kind of share what you what you think, what, what we're hearing and seeing. And let's just kind of uh, skip ahead here if we can uh, get the uh, slides to move. Just in terms of background, uh, important just to say one thing, which is um, I and my firm focus on medium and small size transactions and small, medium and small sized companies. Uh, that's going to frame everything I say. Um, you know, maybe the easy way to say it is don't ask me as much about the Ace Chubb merger as uh, maybe the NorCal Pro Assurance deal or the EMC deal or something uh, smaller like that. So kind of keep that in mind from a perspective standpoint. But in terms of uh, M&A and data, um, I think it's safe to say, broadly speaking, that um, this year has not been very kind to M&A, at least since the shutdown started. Um, this slide here, and I would, I would focus you to the top left-hand corner, um, deal volume in terms of dollars and number of transactions way down, especially in the second quarter of this year. Not a surprise to, I think, a lot of people. Now, this is not insurance. This is a variety of industries, small and medium-sized companies for the most part. So we see there something that's not unexpected, a uh, big decline in uh, transactions. Uh, and I think as many of you know, uh, my colleagues at Benning um, are also very active in the community bank M&A space, which has been a very, very hot area for many years uh, going back. This slide shows you that somewhere just about one deal for every business day of the year has been announced in that industry per for the last you know, four, five, six years. You look at what's happened uh, in Q2 of this year, I mean, it's, it's just a dramatic, dramatic decline. Um, but again, that's not insurance. Where, what does all this mean for insurance? You take a look at, uh, and I focus on the right-hand side of this, of this page, property and casualty deals, which is really the, the, the sector that, that I focus on and I think most of the folks on, on this call do. Um, we've had a very, very healthy level for the last few years, uh, really going back almost to a decade. Um, if you annualize current data, you're going to wind up at what I would call a pretty good year for insurance m and um, probably not at the levels of the last two years, but to put some broader perspective around this, we tend to see in a typical year somewhere between two and three dozen year deals a year in the PNC space. The last couple of years we've seen, you know, more like four dozen or more. Okay, they, they've been really, really high years. I, I would say 2020 seems to be shaping up to be something of a return to about normal. So big contrast to what we, um, what we see in some other industries. Um, and to put a little uh, clarity and realism around it, just to, to, to get, oh, I should also mention the, the agent and broker space. Those of you who follow that, you know very, very active market. I mean, talk about bank deals, there's a deal for every business day of the year. The, the agent and broker space in the insurance world, it's more like two deals for every business day. 
that's been very active, continues to be active. I don't think it's going to be as active as it was last year, uh, but definitely still seeing plenty of announcements there. And, you know, the, the, not, not to spend any time on any particular deal here, but there have been some, some high profile announce, uh, announcements that have occurred before, during, and, 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 and as part of this uh, epidemic. So um, deals are still happening. Uh, you know, and whether it's, uh, you know, a smaller company or a larger company, we're still seeing a lot of that. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. But I thought I, I would just start talking generally about why M&A is happening and then talk about some very specific issues that, that we're seeing right now. You know, and as I say here on, on slide 10, M&A, generally speaking, is driven by a combination of a buyer having optimism and, and some strategic optimism about the future of their space. Um, having a seller that can produce with a certain degree of clarity what they expect to be able to accomplish and having the capital to get those deals done. Um, safe to say when we saw those slides earlier uh, about some other industries, either none or only some of those three factors have been uh, present. And that's why you see deal activity down so much. I think in the insurance industry, and, and it's going to vary by subsector. Um, you know, PNC is not a, 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 a uniform sector by any stretch. In many subsectors of the space, we have all three of those. So generally speaking, I would say I'm not surprised to see the data that, that we just saw that um, M&A volume is reasonably healthy. Um, so with, with those general comments, we can talk a little specifically about what may or may not be driving transactions uh, in our space right now. And, and again, particularly on the PNC side of the house. I think first, just some fundamentals and, uh, you know, we saw from the deputy commissioner, some data on uh, recent results. Uh, I think if you uh, follow our uh, quarterly data pieces that, that Benny puts out, that some of this may look fairly familiar. Um, but I would say, generally speaking, these are public companies uh, as, a, as a proxy for um, current data on how the industry is doing. And what you generally see, I, I mean, we could talk a lot about these slides, but I think for, for this purpose, um, Essentially, more than half the companies have an improved combined ratio year over year, which if you, if you heard the earlier presentation, last year was not a bad year to have an improvement over. So this is, this is pretty good. And generally speaking, most of the companies have earnings which are up year over year. So, um, you know, all things being equal, a healthy industry is supportive of M&A activity uh, rather than a sector that's in trouble. So, so that's, that's good to see. Uh, the other thing that we would we would talk about is M and A pricing data, and focusing here on uh, the um, price to book on the left hand side and price to earnings on the right hand side, and they're both in a gap and a stat um, uh, metric. You know, you're seeing pricing level that's more or less about where we've seen it in the past. Uh, so, again. Uh, should be supportive of transaction activities. You can kind of check that box, if you will. And then uh, I thought we'd have a little fun uh, with slide 15 uh, to talk a little more directly about transaction drivers. Um, some of you may remember that in January of 2019, Hammock held a very successful event uh, that they entitled Let's Make a Deal, and it was about you know, having an open discussion about transactions that could occur with, it, with mutual companies. And uh, frankly, the, the event was very well attended, which, which I think itself spoke to the interest of uh, M&A in our group. Um, and I reproduced it at the bottom half of the slide, transaction drivers, things that I thought were behind transactions that we were working on uh, back in 2019. And so here we are, we're more than a year and a half later in a very, very different economy. Um, what's the same, what, what, what has changed? Um, you know, continued pressure to grow. Back then, 
there was so much pressure, whether it was a strategic plan, whether it was an ownership group that wanted to maximize and grow value, whether it was something else, a um, lot of pressure to grow. And, and I would say that that has not necessarily um, abated universally, but let's, let's maybe just say it this way, um, there are a lot more things that uh, folks are worried about right now in this current environment than necessarily a strategic plan and a growth plan. So probably a little less pressure there. Uh, interestingly enough though, the next one, uh, I had commented on the desire to acquire. Um, and AM Best periodically puts out a survey of industry executives and says, um, tell us uh, whether or not you have an interest in M&A and why. And interestingly, that data had changed dramatically over the last decade or so. Uh, if I recall my numbers, something like a third of the respondents 10 plus years ago said they were interested in M&A. Uh, two thirds last year. Now I haven't seen a survey for this year yet, um, but I can tell you anecdotally, uh, the inbound calls from insurance companies saying things like, hey, we haven't seen a deal in a while from you. What's going on? Can you share anything with us? We're still interested. It sounds maybe counterintuitive in this crazy environment we're in, but it seems like that that pressure to deploy the capital and things like that is, is uh, certainly not going away. Um, capital markets performance, I mean, that means a lot of things to uh, different, uh, different people. And, and I mean it here in a couple of different ways. On one hand, um, when companies are doing well and uh, stock prices are up, there tends to be some enthusiasm among the public companies to make an acquisition and look, that, that affects everyone. Um, but you've also got the side of the equation, which is your investment returns. And you guys live that every day, not getting five, six, 7% current income anymore on investments. So that creates some pressure, uh, to think about, uh, some organic growth and some underwriting profitability. So we'll call that maybe about the same, uh, capital levels, uh, or capital availability, uh, probably safe to say that, um, that's about the same. I have some comments and some data for you to show you in, in, a, in a few slides um, about what we're seeing there. And it's not uniform, but sake of argument, we'll kind of call that the same. And um, seller demographics, certainly the same. And I, I'd say there may be intensifying a bit. Um, you know, we've always talked about the fact that there are a lot of folks in the industry that are getting up there in years. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's very interesting when you see the data. There's a lot of gray hair in our industry. And uh, that leads to retirement. It leads to succession planning. Uh, and sometimes there are boards that look around and say, hey, we're all getting ready to call it a day. And our management team's getting ready to call it a day. Do we really have the right succession plan? Or is it time to find a bigger partner? So I think you've, you've always had that. What I think has changed, and, and we see this every time we have a challenging economic environment, um, recessions and, and, and things like that, there are some subset of sellers who just say, yeah, I was thinking of going in another few years, but it's time to call it a day. Um, it, it, it's not very scientific. I don't know that it's supported by a lot of data or studies or anything like that, but fundamentally, it seems to happen. Um, the, um, trouble advancing here, pricing and rate is something that is, uh, going cuts both ways. As I say here, uh, on one hand, um, uh, when companies start to get rate, and this is some data here on slide 16 about commercial lines pricing. When companies start to get some rate, on one hand, you have folks say, hey, the business is starting to look a little better. Maybe I was thinking about selling, but don't need to now. Um, 
On the other hand, you have companies saying, hey, my business is starting to look a little better. It might be time to be able to get a better price and I should sell. So we kind of see that working both ways. And obviously it varies very, very much by line of business. Um, one of the things that um, we find very interesting is that, um, you know, whether you're in personal lines or commercial lines and what line you're in, the numbers are very, very different. This is a great uh, USI uh, created this chart. And, um, you know, you see some areas, look, if you're in DNO, uh, rates are going up at astronomical levels. Obviously things like workers comp, not so much. Uh, personal lines has had its own good and bad uh, challenges with some of the refunds and rebates and things like that. Uh, so, um, you know, very, um, you know, very much that is a general comment, but it, 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 it varies very much by line. Thought also I could share with you um, a little bit of, um, you know, some other possible transaction drivers that we're starting to see. Um, look, um, this pandemic, uh, that's <laughs> pretty darn obvious. Um, I don't think we have to spend a lot of time talking about that, but that, that has created uh, both some sellers and it's created some folks that are very, very much afraid of um, maybe going into the market. And look, as, as we proceed through this presentation, I'd like to share some of the things that we're seeing, you know, kind of day to day in that area. You know, catastrophe losses looking much more significant than um, we have seen um, in some past. Uh, years and uh, you know that always creates both some good and some bad opportunities for folks so um, you know we'll, we'll, we'll keep them keep our eye on that one um, you know reinsurance costs that's something that goes hand in hand with rate and and it's been a little bit of a, uh, of, a of a challenge for folks because on one hand you're seeing really really nice rate increases but if it's also affecting you on the other end with reinsurance costs going up, and there was something that just came out this morning about reinsurance costs haven't gone up as much as folks think they're going to be going up, uh, that creates all sorts of different scenarios. Uh, you know, not, not talking out of school because it's a, it's a public company, um, but um, the, um, 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 the, um, situation with reinsurance costs, there's a company called Kingstone, which some of you may know because they operate in this general area of the country. Public company out of New York um, had an A rating. In order to buy the level of reinsurance, and they do a lot of coastal type of, of, of work, um, in order to buy what AMBEST said you need to buy in order to maintain your, your, your A rating, which is like a one in 200 year event, they just couldn't afford it. The numbers didn't make sense. It was better for them and their management's view to take a reduction in rating and a more reasonable amount of reinsurance than what best one. I mean, that's, that's going to play out and, and that will create a certain number of sellers and things like that as, as, as we go along. Um, you know, this whole doing things virtually is a transaction driver that we've never dealt with before, but we're certainly seeing it. As many of companies that are calling in and saying, hey, we'd like to see a deal from you. We're still in the M&A game. We're ready to buy. There are other companies that are saying, hey, I just can't get comfortable with this environment. And, you know, I'll share some ideas on that later. I, you know, in terms of uh, the rest of the page, I, I put on there what I call oldies but goodies, things that are still true that, you know, we've talked about in the past. We've seen it, um, uh, you know, time and time again. I think these are all still fairly true. You know, you still see smaller companies that are doing well, but would really like to get an A rating. And uh, they, you know, they can't get it without, uh, you know, being part of something bigger. Um, you, um, 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 you know, you see the succession issues, which we already talked about. Um, there's a lot of companies out there that have capital, they have operational expertise, they have capacity. Uh, all those reasons uh, for making an acquisition. So, you know, there's still a lot of motivation out there. Um, 
I don't want to spend a lot of time on 19 and 20 and 21, but we touched on earlier the whole idea of capital offerings and uh, available capital. What you'll see is there is still plenty of available capital for the industry as a general statement. A lot going on there. Um, what we are seeing and we're a little bit uncomfortable with is a fairly strong bright line, if you will, between the larger entities and the smaller entities. I uh, haven't seen as much availability on the smaller entities as yet. And you know, this is just a selection of some equity offerings, some debt offerings. Uh, they tend to be larger companies. Um, you are seeing very successful offerings and you know, on the equity side, very easy to talk about lemonade and you know their valuation, which basically doubled after they did the offering. Um, not sure it makes a whole lot of sense, but that's not my area to, to, to judge. But safe to say that some of these companies are finding capital available uh, in, in very attractive ways. Uh, you know, on the debt side, these are all big companies down at the bottom of the page. They're basically raising money at ridiculously low rates for very, very long periods of time. Um, they're able to refinance their balance sheets very, very well. We're not seeing that as much in the smaller companies. And um, there is, it's going to come, but I certainly think there is some concern today as we sit here today in September, whether or not smaller companies can access the capital markets anywhere near as easily as um, the, um, um, uh, the larger companies can. Um, so let's kind of take a little break here for a second, take a breath if you want to call it that, and talk about outlook and predictions and some of the real world things that we're seeing right now. Um, do I look nervous at all as I'm doing this? Um, I, as I said, this is an interesting time and uh, there's a lot of unknowns. So this is a little bit more of a difficult section than, than we might have done in the past. And uh, there's a humorous economist that I've seen speak, and I know that probably sounds like it's a, you know, an impossibility, but this guy's name is Jeff Threadgold, and he's actually pretty funny. Um, he had listed one time a bunch of erroneous predictions when somebody was asking him to give a, a list of predictions. You know, it was things like the, the record company executive that turned down the Beatles because he said they weren't any good and they wouldn't sell and things like that. Uh, I found a couple that he had on telephones and computers, and I kind of thought given the environment that we're in right now and how important that technology and the evolution of that technology has, has brought us to this point where we can be together even though we're not physically together. And I thought they were kind of funny. And um, just in case I didn't make myself clear, um, I put that quote uh, <laughs> that I said earlier today, which is this is a tough presentation and it's tough to make some predictions here. But let's, uh, let's give it a try. And um, I've divided this up between capital markets and M&A. And uh, then I'll kind of conclude with some things that you're seeing that I thought you might find helpful if you're either a potential buyer or a potential seller. Uh, you know, in terms of the capital markets side, uh, I think it's safe to say that the markets are gonna evolve with the economy. I don't think that's an earth shattering statement. Um, I think uh, what we've seen so far, and I kind of hinted at it earlier, there's a fairly strong division between the larger companies with investment grade ratings and the smaller companies that we spend most of our time with. Um, the ones we saw, you know, slide 21 there, are able to uh, raise capital almost at will. Um, we, we do think that that will evolve and will change. Um, one of the insights we have, um, the folks that I work with that work in the community bank environment have seen the evolution already this year from the large companies only being able to access the markets to now the community institutions are very successful in accessing the markets. So we're, we're not there yet in insurance, but we think it's going to uh, occur and, and, it, and it generally does. It starts with the big investment grade credits and works its way down. 
Um, and, and that brings a couple of opportunities for everyone in this room, whether it's financing an acquisition or it's even refinancing maybe some debt on your balance sheet. You can do it more effect, uh, effectively and at lower costs. Um, we're seeing that play out in the public markets with stock repurchase plans. You know, you're seeing it everywhere from you know, all state uh, down to little company Unico American out in California. I was trying to find a public company that, that I knew that had a Z at the end so I could go all state to, to whatever, but couldn't find that, but Unico works for us. Um, the other thing that it, it's important to keep in mind for anyone in, in, in this meeting today is there are a lot of sources of liquidity if you need it for an M&A transaction or, or other strategic opportunity. You know, there's your bank, there's the FHLV, there's other sources, surplus notes and things like that. So um, I'd like to see those sources become as competitive for this audience as they are for the, um, the larger companies, but uh, that will come with a little bit of time. Moving over to the M&A and strategic side, uh, still a tremendous interest in M&A to supplement that organic growth and leverage the capital. But um, I'm gonna say here, I think that this is going to be more of a seller-driven market for the next year than a buyer-driven market. What do I mean by that? Um, look, we, we, we've seen it before uh, in this presentation and in other places that certainly there's a lot of buyers out there. What it's going to take is quality sellers to step up and fit with those buyers. Um, you know, that's going to accelerate the market. That's what we've had the last few years. There have been some really quality opportunities and the buyers have been there to take advantage of those opportunities. I mean, put it simply, you need to have something that you want to buy. Um, and we're, we're a little short on that right now. So it's going to take sellers to step up to the market. And where are those opportunities going to come from? Uh, you know, first one, need for capital. Um, there are good companies out there small young companies that are growing nicely um, they're going to need capital and if the capital isn't available to them as it is the larger companies as we, as we just spoke about that's where they're going to have to find another solution and that may be some sort of m a transaction you know a great example one of the slides earlier had the hippo spinnaker spinnaker deal there you know, Spinnaker was writing over, I think, over $200 million in, in gross premium uh, on, you know, $40 million in capital or something like that. So they were quota sharing a lot of that away. Having a bigger parent changes a lot of that dynamic and lets them keep more profitability. Um, I mean, here, here's a question that came in from the audience, which I think is timely and it fits right, right. slides. Uh, the, simply the question is, what is the current state of access to access to surplus note capital and not yeah. clarify not as part of related affiliations but for smaller to mid-sized mutual insurance companies yeah that's a great question and and uh yeah i really kind of glossed over that the surplus note market is mirroring the larger capital markets in many ways in that it is um much more attractive for the larger companies um you know, if, if you're effectively a large, almost investment grade company, you can get surplus notes on very, very good terms, very low interest rates, comparable to bank debt almost, and you know how subordinated uh, that is. Um, we're seeing it a little bit in the small end. There was a deal done out in the Midwest, um, I wanna say earlier this summer, uh, but I think, it, Still a little bit more challenging, uh, very dependent upon circumstance. Uh, what's the reason? What's the underlying company? Things like that. But I'd say it probably mirrors the, the general capital markets in that it's much more available, much more plentiful at the large end, uh, more challenging at the smaller end. But I wouldn't say the market's closed, Scott, by, by any stretch. That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we're we're going to talk about uh, small companies growing, needing capital. Also, those that may have some challenges. And I'm not talking about a truly distressed company, 
but a company that's just dealing with some challenges of growth. We, we have a client right now um, that is very successful in what they do. They're just not the management team that's able to figure out how to grow it. Every time they try and go into a new state, they kind of mess it up. Um, and I think they've kind of realized at this point, you know, we're probably going to have to seek a, a larger partner because as good as we are at what we do at, at, at the core, we just can't seem to grow this. And it's not, it's not right for our employees. It's not right for our customers. We need to get bigger we need to, we need to build this. Uh, so there'll be opportunities. Um, I think we've already touched on the ownership and the management change uh, issue. Um, you know, as the industry ages, you start not to necessarily get the new blood, especially in some of these smaller companies that you'd like. So that, that creates some sellers. Um, uh, that last one, I just kind of stuck on there. Uh, we hear this every four or eight years. Uh, and in 30 some years I've been doing this, I, I, I hear it constantly. In an election year, if the other party wins, they're gonna raise taxes, my capital gains tax is gonna go up. Even if I made more money on the sale next year, I'm not gonna keep as much, so let's sell now. Um, I don't know that I've ever actually met a, uh, and you're really talking about privately held insurance companies here, a privately held company that's made that their number one reason for selling. Um, I, I offer it because we hear about it a lot. I'm not sure whether there's any science to back that up. Um, and obviously the world is very, very unpredictable as far as politics and elections are concerned and things like that. Um, what I thought we'd, we'd kind of finish up with here is some things that my colleagues and I put together that depending on whether you're gonna be a buyer or a seller, you may find some of this helpful and, and it's all driven by what we've been experiencing ourselves with our clients over the last you know, five, six months here. Um, you know, the, the first one clearly um, you know, applies to buyers and sellers and everyone in between. The same professionalism, the same discipline, the same things that you do in any strategic opportunity apply today as they did before. Probably even a little bit more so because you have less wiggle room for making a mistake in, in this environment. Um, I think you need to be flexible uh, and think about things a little bit differently. Look, you know, we've been in the middle of processes where we had management meetings between buyer and seller scheduled and the government mandated a shutdown and all of a sudden people couldn't get together. You have to find ways to deal with that. Um, and, and I think we can touch on that in a little bit more detail as we go through these, uh, some real, real examples of that. But I think first of all, if you're a buyer, if you're a management, member of senior management and you've been thinking you're on an M&A path, Check in with the board and make sure they're going to be comfortable with your plans in this virtual environment because there are some directors, and we have seen this, who say, I don't care what the strategic plan is. If my guys can't get in there, kick the tires, physically walk around, have a bunch of dinners and lunches with the management team and meet the employees, we're not going forward with a deal. So that's a, that's a really important thing to, 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 to keep in mind. Uh, I think from the seller's perspective in this unusual time, being able to clearly explain how you're doing and why and what effect the COVID-19 environment is having on your company. And it's not good enough to say, oh, it's not affecting us or everything's fine. Uh, this is an environment where you have much more skeptical buyers they're asking really good questions. You need to have some really good answers about it. And I think for the buyers in the room, the folks that can answer that question as sellers very well, tell you a lot about their command and, and knowledge of their own business, people you wanna have on board in your, your, your company post deal. Um, so we're seeing that a lot. Um, if, if you can't explain it, you probably don't even go into the market right now because that's the first question people are gonna ask. Uh, you know, this whole remote working and accessibility thing is, is, uh, is certainly, it's interesting for all of us. Uh, to someone of my vintage, I never would have expected that we'd be working on deals and 
having buyer and seller never meet. Um, I just picked up a new client engagement and I have not met that client face to face. I mean, this is, this is pretty crazy. Uh, you have to be comfortable with, with this environment. Um, and there's levels of that comfort and we can talk about that uh, in a little bit. I, I think the other thing to keep in mind and, and we've been working on a, a project I listed here by its code name Project Measure. Um, there were multiple really good buyers for this company and we were on the selling side. Um, one of those buyers I knew pretty well, I called the head of M&A and it's a very big company. And he said, yeah, I appreciate the call, but you know what, that's gonna go down to the divisional level. We have an M&A head for that division here, call this guy, um, we'll call him Ken, okay, as our co-chair. And then I talked to Ken and Ken said, hey, you know what, it's actually Scott's job, but they did a great job of transitioning. They knew where it belonged within the company and we got to the right person. And uh, that party actually has executed a letter of intent and hopes to close on this deal in the next month with our client. Um, there's a contrast there. One of the other pre-identified really great buyers, I called the head of M&A who I knew, um, emailed, called, never got a response. Three months later, um, received a call from another person in their M&A department mentioning that my contact had gone out on extended leave and nobody bothered to check emails or voicemails. Well, you know, things happen in the world, of course, and we all have to deal with things. But if you're in the M&A business, that's not, uh, that's not a good way to work remotely. Um, what else have we seen? You know, sellers, this is time to be fair and honest about your pricing expectations. Um, this is not an environment to shoot for the moon and, and try to command the highest price ever for a company in your industry. Um, buyers are much more skeptical in this environment. Um, so I think focusing on quality information, quality data, and pricing your company fairly is the right way to get a deal done. Um, I think on, on, on both sides, planning, comfort level with due diligence, things like that. I mean, um, one of my colleagues and I are working on a transaction right now where the buyer and the seller have never met. Um, it is, um, it's an insurance fee for service business. It's not an underwriter. It's one of those businesses that I would have absolutely bet that the buyer and seller need to meet multiple times, probably have some dinners together, just get to know one another because the seller really cares about making the decision as to who they're going to join going forward. And the buyer likewise has to really have a feel that these are the right people to fit in their organization. Um, they have done it all virtually. So uh, it's been a lot of Teams meetings, but they've done it. Um, so I think everyone has to assess where they come out on that spectrum. Um, and I know this last one is going to sound like a, a blatant plug for PAMIC, which maybe it is, but I, I think it's some of the best advice. Um, that we've, we've come up with in this young pandemic era. And that is networking and expanding relationships while you can is more important than it used to be. And by that, I mean, and I'll tell you directly, there's a, I think uh, one of you, number of you know my colleague, James Aducci uh, in the insurance space. James and I are working on something where um, buyer and seller have not met. They've met virtually but they knew one another prior from various industry events and things like that. And I think, uh, what did we have? We had a half dozen offers for this seller. The one they picked for a variety of reasons was the party they were most comfortable with, which were these guys that while they hadn't physically met, they knew each other from events, they had seen each other around, they knew each other reputationally, uh, and it really helped seal the deal. So. If you're a potential buyer, potential seller, going to events like this, getting to know one another, um, keeping the lines of communication open, I think can be very helpful 
in trying to get a deal done in this crazy environment. Um, it's really, um, you know, very, very different than being able to sit down and spend lots and lots of time together. Um, what I would say at this point, um, I, I, I've tried to, to keep on timing here. I think we're doing okay. Uh, I know there may be some things that um, need to be asked. Uh, Scott, I don't know if you're getting questions, but yeah. I, I'd be delighted to try and be helpful if I can. Yeah, actually, the, the only question I got was the one that I read off before, but, um, but no, I think this has been a fantastic presentation. It's really good. Maybe I can just share a question that I, you know, a couple months ago, I was commonly getting in my role working with insurance companies mm -hmm. is uh, clients and even others would say, you know, or, it seems like now would be a really good time. There should be a lot of good deals out there. I mean, that's the common line I heard. Yep. But then at one of your slides early on in the presentation, I think it showed only two transactions being closed, if I, read, if I remember this right, uh, with, the, with the PNC insurance. There's very few transactions occurring. So, uh, no, I, no, I don't think that was right, but I, um, let's see. But that's the general gist out there. I mean, I just sort yeah. of wrap my hands around everything that you've uh, talked about and yeah. tried to like, digest and sort of connecting it to that simple concept that a lot of folks are thinking about. Yeah, there you go. So, so, yeah. 21. so there were 21. But, 21, they, yeah. but um, yeah, I, th I think it's something that we've heard a lot as well, Scott. I think you, you and I probably travel in a lot of the same circles. And <laughs> I think folks, we do. <laughs> you know, kind of ask those questions. I don't, and, and let, me, let me qualify this with our firm as a rule doesn't spend a lot of time with what would be called truly distressed transactions. So companies close to liquidation is probably not, not something we're, we're involved in. So I can't speak to that. But for the most part, you have a number of interested buyers. So there's going to be some demand if there's some quality sellers. It's going to be really, really hard to steal a company. Um, if you want to call it that, get a really good deal. Um, and, you know, the other thing that has, has happened in the space, as we've had a decade or more of two, three, four dozen deals a year, the data is out there. So, you know, you go over to the pricing slide and you say, everyone can look at this same data. This data is available. Um, everybody has accountants, lawyers, investment bankers. If, if the right number, and I'm just going to pick something, is a 20% premium to book value, um, and that's what the data shows, and you come in and you say, it's a great company, but we're going to offer you 80% of book value, folks are going to say, well, wait a minute, but the, the data's out there. This is, this is the wrong number. I, you're not serious. Right. So, um, you know, that's a, that's a contrived example, but, you know, I think it's, it's very hard to find an absolute steal as much as it is um, finding a quality company that you can bring um, a fair price to so you get a good return. And you can find, maybe by working a little harder, find that diamond in the rough that other folks maybe looked past. Um, I, mean, I remember years ago, I represented a really fantastic company down in Maryland. And... The, the, the challenge to the company was it relied very, very heavily on reinsurance because it was a small company. But their core business was fabulous. I mean, just it's loss ratios and expense ratios that everybody would just, just die to have. The buyer of it ultimately was uh, the Hanover Group, uh, not, not the reinsurer, the, the, the public company, THG. And they were able to look at it and say, I can pay a little more than other people can but I have the ability to accept a lot more risk than other folks, reduce that reliance and cost of reinsurance. And they wound up, wound up keeping in touch with them after it. They made their purchase price back in three years, wow. which is a very low number of years based on my experience in this industry. This is a much more steady state, they right. can take the long approach. So I think, you know, that's probably a better strategy of getting a deal mm -hmm. than trying to find something that's just, you know, ridiculously low priced. 
Well, that's good. Yeah, that's, I'd heard that so many times. So it was interesting to, to hear your perspective. We're, we're hearing it as well, too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I, the, at this point, really don't have any, no other questions that popped up. I think, uh, Tony, again, an excellent presentation. Really appreciate you presenting today. And now you got one under your belt. So yeah. say if someone else well, asks you to do one, say, yeah, I've done that before. So. I, I really appreciate everyone. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate the invitation and I appreciate everyone indulging me in, in, in learning how to do this. And uh, I very much look forward to seeing you all in person whenever that uh, is allowed. Well, hey, hey, Tony, just to prove this is working, I already got a text from one of my clients. They want to meet you. So uh, I would be delighted to. Go. So <laughs> this has worked. Um, Terrific. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Tony. And uh, I'm going to continue on here. Just want to make some announcements. Um, we're going to take a uh, basically a break for lunch. Um, uh, this is very important. I think this to all the participants to the way this has to work, you actually have to log off the, the webinar. And then at 1255, Ken will be back and he'll make some afternoon announcements. And then he'll introduce the next group which is a panel uh, on a tech COVID panel, uh, discuss, talking at one o'clock. But you will receive a, um, an email invite from, from Brittany, from PAMIC, to log back into the afternoon session. So that's a really big, <laughs> big problem. So hopefully you're listening to this. Log off and then you'll log back in just like you did this morning or around mid-morning, I guess. Um, so there you go. So everybody have a nice lunch, wherever you may be, home, office, et cetera. And we will regroup at uh, 1255. All right. Thank you very much.